Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, it was the longest siege of the Vietnam War, Khe San. For those who fought there and survived, their experiences have never been far from their minds. I talked to a former Marine who was determined to preserve those memories. The story of Bravo Company at Khe San, next on Dialogue. I just thought, oh my God, you know, we're not, you're not going to survive this, you know. And I was never so scared in all my life. I mean, just absolutely scared to death. The reason everyone around us is dying is because there's a machine gun nest over there. And uh, at this time, the fighting was intense. I mean, up close, personal bayonets, satchel charging their bunkers, flamethrowers. Average age of a combat veteran in Vietnam, 18. The thing that was really amazing about that was you had young children that at 20 weeks before Quezon were sitting at home at the breakfast table with their mom and dad. You don't know what combat is, you don't know what war is until you face it. And it's not John Wayne. I fight for Vietnam a weak moment, understand. They go over here to build morale in this never, never land. They creeps on the monster trains and a meat con delta slush. They didn't mention one damn word about mortars fired at us. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. You were just watching part of a preview for a documentary called Bravo, Common Men, Uncommon Valor. It's about the men of Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 26 Marines, and their part in the Battle of Khe Sanh in the Vietnam War. Lasting 77 days from late January to early April 1968, the siege of Khe Sanh would ultimately result in what's considered the most massive bombing campaign in military history. But it also involved gruesome trench warfare. The result, a stalemate or an American victory, depending on who's writing the history, would mark a turning point in the war. And for those who fought at Quezon, it was a pivotal point in their lives as well. One former Marine Lance Corporal who was at Quezon was determined not to let the memories of his compatriots fade away. So Ken Rogers and his wife Betty embarked on a creative journey to produce the documentary Bravo. Idaho Public Television will be airing their two-hour program on its World Channel on November 10th, the birthday of the United States Marines. And Ken and Betty, residents of Eagle, Idaho, joined me to talk about their passion for this project and their adventure in filmmaking. Also joining us, I'm pleased to say, is one of the Bravo Company veterans in the video, Steve Weiss who was a Marine Corporal and now lives in California. It's a pleasure to have you here and thanks for coming all that way to be here. And thanks to you for being here as well. Thank you. Let's start actually first with you, Betty. You're not a veteran of Case Han, <laughs> but this project actually is your brainchild. Tell me about how it came about. Well, Ken and I started attending the Case Han Veterans um, Annual Reunions. And um, as I sat and listened to the men reunited talking about their common experience, um, it occurred to me that uh, this was history that, that would disappear if something wasn't done to preserve it. And um, we also, I, I had, uh, we had already lost one of the men from Bravo Company, Jake, who's mentioned in the film. Uh, and then uh, we knew that, that Dan Horton was um, ill with cancer, and, and so we felt compelled to um, move forward and And, and no get experience busy. in filmmaking, we None should say. at all. And, <laughs> you know, um, you told me when we were talking earlier that actually as you were leaving Quezon, you looked down, yes, and you thought, this is a story. Right. That it, was a long time ago, and, and you, you know. Well, it's, it was like, I left Case on, and I said, that's a heck of a story, and I need to figure out how to tell it. I've been trying to tell it for 40-some-odd years, and uh, it never came out right, and probably it needed to percolate for a while in there. Uh, so so when Betty said, you know, I think we should make a video of these guys, what would you think? Uh, yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> you know, as long as we didn't ever have to do it, then it was okay. So. <laughs> Because you tried writing a novel, yes. Right, I tried it, writing it, a novel. I've written poetry about it. I've written essays. Uh, and But it didn't tell the, the, this whole story of uh, emotionally, mm -hmm. the story. And yeah. why was it so important to you to tell it? Well, because 
for a lot of reasons. Uh, I think the history of the human race is fraught with tales of war. I think it's one of the th things that we do best is make war, and it's also one of the most terrible things. And I, I think that Vietnam veterans for years didn't really want to tell their stories, and I thought we had a very interesting tale to tell about what happens in war and what happens after war. And what happens in one, just right. one right. small unit one, of that cohesive one small unit. unit. You were part of that, um, a big part of it, Steve Weiss. Um, and Betty, you had seen Steve, right, at these yes. reunions? Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me what you thought when you... Um, of course, you hear stories about everyone, but um, I kept seeing this, this tall, blonde-headed man who was walking around and, and seemed to garner a lot of respect from other people. And I leaned to Ken one day and I said, who is this guy? And, um, and Ken said he's been through every bad thing that ever happened to Bravo Company in, in this time and survived it. And, and um, so that was, that was part of the inspiration for doing the film, was to tell Steve's story as well. Now, only, I think, what, 14 men plus, plus you right. uh, are agreed to, to be interviewed. Why did you want to be part of this project and talk about things that are uh, very, very difficult to to discuss? Uh, <clears throat> well, when Ken approached me and, and asked me about, you know, doing it, my first reaction was, A, I didn't want to do it, B, I didn't think I had anything worth talking about. Uh, but he told me to, you know, he says, think about it, and he'd talk to me, you know, tomorrow. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought about these guys deserve some kind of recognition, you know, and I, I figured it. You know, I survived These guys for, meaning the ones who didn't make it as well? The, the ones that, yes. Okay. The ones that didn't make it back, and there were too many of them. Uh, but I thought it was my, you know, my, my duty and my honor if I could somehow help put out to the public that these guys di died, you know, and they died protecting this country and, you know, for our honor. And, and these were incredibly brave men, and slash boys. And young, that's what I was going to say, yeah. young. One of the things that I found so interesting and, and really <coughs> kind of, as we say in print journalism, a nut graph, a seminal part of the film was were your, the recordings that you had made for your mother, mm. you know, to send home to your mom, which included putting the microphone in front of some of these other men, some who are not with us anymore. Let's take a listen to uh, one of those recordings. Pretty soon we'll be home before we know it. We, we're praying and hoping to one day return to the world. We have a wonderful story to tell each, each and everybody back in the world. Oh, Mom, it's me again. Uh, I guess you can tell by the guys that you've heard so far that, that they're uh, quite a bunch of guys. Uh, we got a little bit of everything, I guess. The first man, he's uh, a preacher. We got a joker and a thief. The loud and happy, the sad. We got a little bit of everything in this squad. Uh, so say goodbye. A little bit of everything in the unit, and that, that first man that we heard, the, the preacher, so to speak, did not survive, did no. not make it. But, his, no. but he has, in a way, because of that recording, you know what I mean? Yes. And, and I think the recordings show the diversity of people brought together, children, really, in a way. Um, and, it, and he's saying, you know, we'll have a great story to tell when we come back to the world. Of course, you were in the world, but it didn't seem like you were in the world because it was such a foreign place. World was a common term for us over there because where we were, the world was a different place. Right, you know. right. Um, now, one of the Betty said you survived a, a lot of a lot of things, and and a big part of your film is about something called the Ghost Patrol. Right. Um, and we should say that um, for what one, for background here, you were what five six thousand Marines Yards. Uh, oh. sur surrounded by twenty thousand. No, uh, uh, a you know. lot of. You no, know, that's that's open for debate. Anywhere from twenty to forty-five thousand, a lot of people. A we lot were, of you, you were surrounded, and you were very, very close to the line to right. to, to North Vietnam. Right. In fact, there's this great scene where they're, they're so close to you that you can hear them with a stethoscope right. in the trenches. Amazingly right. close. You're sent out on a patrol, relatively routine, if anything can be called routine in that type of situation. And what happens? Uh, the Ghost Patrol basically 
they knew, as you mentioned, they knew that we were uh, surrounded. They knew that they were digging trenches, and we were basically supposed to go out on a recon and just kind of get a feel for were they actually digging. They knew they were tunneling under the base. The and North Vietnamese. Yes, sorry. And uh, so the patrol was basically just to go look see, mm -hmm. you know, see see what the situation looked like, get a feel for what was going on. Uh, unfortunately, we walked into an ambush, and it was a uh, you know it was a pretty massive ambush. Right, and so. when you re read the histories of Quezon, this is is mentioned what happened, and um, you were there. And let's take a listen to what happened. I worked my way out and back to the base, and when I came in, it was just like. You know, where is everybody? You know, and I just remember, I just remember the guy saying, you're pretty much it. You know, there isn't a whole lot. And uh, when I got back to my squad area, uh, Smith, Arthur Smith was in the bunker. And, uh, and I came in and uh, he said, he was it. Can you take a break a minute? It's still hard to talk about after all these years, but you were one of just a very few survivors of that ambush. Yes. And um, it, it's something that, as I understand, gets thought about. There isn't a day that goes by, right? That somehow oh. the other you don't. Oh, there's never a day goes by we don't. You know, I don't think about it. And how do you deal with what would be called the survivor guilt of being one of the few? How, how have you come to deal with that for people listening who might have that as well from being in, a, in an action where they survived? I don't uh, know if I'll ever come to deal with it completely. You know, I do have survivor, survivor's guilt. Uh, I don't understand why I survived when s pretty much every one of my squad was killed. Um, it's something, you, you know, I, I mean, I try to deal with it. But the, the problem is combat changes you. War changes you. Combat changes you permanently. And uh, dealing with that, you know, it's a daily, you know, it's a daily thing. It doesn't go away. Um, I don't think I'll ever understand, you know, why I survived. But you did ask for help. Uh, you have, you know, the, the VA does have people that can assist in this um, process. The VA, I was amazed. Uh, when I went to the VA, which was six, seven years ago, I think, originally. I didn't have much faith in going and speaking to someone. I didn't have a, you know, I didn't really believe in psychiatrists or any of that. And, uh, but when I went to the VA, uh, there was a Dr. Keenan, uh, and she was in charge of that group, and an absolutely amazing lady, understood Marines, soldiers, or, you know, she understood combat, she understood what we were dealing with, and she probably was the biggest influence that ever happened to me. The VA was, was, is a remarkable thing as far as if you, if you have issues, they need to go to the VA, you know, because I didn't think they would understand. I mean, I walked in there going, you know, they, you know, and when I walked in, and no offense, but when I walked in and saw it was a woman, my first thought was, how was she ever going to understand what I went through? And I was ready to try and walk out. And I'm glad I didn't. It would have been the biggest mistake of my life. So <clears throat> the VA has got help, and they need to go if they need it. And important that Steve was in the film, did talk about this. It must have been difficult to ask these questions. You weren't on the, <clears throat> pardon me, on the Ghost Patrol. We'll talk in a minute about another action that, that you were part of. But how difficult was it for you to ask because you did the interviews, right, of these men? It wasn't, too, okay. it wasn't that, that difficult. You know, uh, most of the people we interviewed had seen the questions ahead of time, so I think that they okay. had ample time to think about it. But still, it welled up, even though they had well, seen the questions. Yes, yeah. they welled up, and, uh, you know, I think the act of articulating their emotions, it, it just opened them up and out it came, uh, which was amazing to me to sit there and watch that. Uh, experience. I mean, making that part of the film was amazing. And Betty, you interviewed your husband, right? Uh, along with Mark Spear, who was also... a geographer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what mm -hmm. was that like to hear? Did you hear stories that you didn't, hadn't heard before? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. So he reacted the same way, you know, just opened up in a way that he hadn't before. Mm -hmm. 
Well, as I mentioned, there was another action, um, what's called payback right. uh, for what occurred. I mean, we don't know the exact numbers of who, how many died on the Ghost Patrol. It's called the Ghost Patrol because so many didn't come back. It's, it's a name gave it, given to it later, but not many. You were one of the Ghost two Patrol, in, two in your squad that came back. That's it. Two, right. three, three, three. Well, in your three squad. count myself. Yeah, right. But the Ghost Patrol kind of picked up from what I understand. The, the name is because uh, so many men were left on the battlefield, mm. and hence they've uh, said they're still walking the battlefield. I see. And then the the payback day, which was about a month later, was when you went to go try and get those men, and and potentially kill some of the people that had killed them. And it, it's an incredible, in your film, um, you describe, it was bayonets. Right. Fixed bayonets. It was a bayonet charge. A bayonet charge. The only official bayonet charge, I think, of the Vietnam War. I mean, it's pretty primitive stuff, you know, so. And again, many lost in that as yes, well. Yes, we lost, I believe there were 12 KIAs, but I think there were more Purple Hearts issued that day than there were men that went on the patrol. So some people were wounded more than once, and it was, uh, uh, it was savage. Uh, it was the most amazing day of my life. Uh, I think about it every day. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was, I was lucky enough not to have been in some of the worst parts of that day, but I was a witness to it, and, uh, which is kind of how my whole Vietnam experience was. I, I was a witness to a lot of things. Uh, that happened to other people. Maybe that's why I want to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And I forgot to ask you, but it's really interesting. When you crawled back, uh, you know, to find out that you were one of the few survivors, it, you were only out maybe a quarter mile, and it took you something like eight or nine hours to, to get back. Correct. Um, I made it back through the shadows of darkness. And it took you 30 years to figure that out until you were in this therapy session where right. this woman pulled that out of you. And that, that um, feeling of time slowing down and time speeding up, I think is very well elucidated in a particular clip in your film. Let's take a look at that. And when he came up, I just squeezed and shot. And it was the oddest thing. My, my instructor from the range in Camp Pendleton was there explaining to me about breathing and squeezing. My first shot, right in the head, right in the forehead. I had just done something I really didn't wish to do. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. Um, one thing is just the filmic style here. You had a professional editor working on this who decided to, to do that. Talk about that. Don Nutt. Mm -hmm. um, he is a Vietnam veteran. Uh, his entire career has been film and uh, he has, he's an award-winning editor who found us and wanted to help tell this story and uh, just created a masterpiece in my mind. Just an incredible man with wonderful talent. He understood the story that we wanted to tell. He understood that he had the same sensibilities that we did about how to tell it. And he's showing kind of what's going on in the mind as, as all of that is happening, this weirdness with time. And he chose that man to do it with, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. I haven't talked to him, because Frank uh, is, is an interesting character. He was he's very Catholic and he did not want to shoot anybody. And as you hear, that is his first shot ever he realizes he has to kill somebody. Why did you think it was important to include him in the film? He's a he's a pacifist. He talks about how he does doesn't believe in war. Well, I, th you know, I think that there's a wide variety of opinions and points of view on combat, and there are a lot of guys I think in Vietnam that were like Frank. I went to high school with a guy that was a pacifist. He got drafted, and he swore he wasn't ever going to kill anybody, and he went over there. He'd been over there six weeks, and he shot some people and. I, you know, I think that's a story that is probably common throughout combat. I don't know that any of us want to kill anybody. Right. You know, I just, but I mean, he was, you know, yeah. particularly right. didn't want but it. it. But, you know, he didn't want it, but he did because they were killing his people, as he says in the film. And his people were more important than his desire not to kill somebody. Now, he also is a bit controversial uh, among some of the uh, veterans, yes, right. because he... Right. He believes that you were defeated there, and and um, and says so that. 
Yes, whipped, I think, is the word he uses. Yeah, he, sa he, he said we, we got whipped, but I think he's more... Uh, I think he believes that, it, that we got whipped because the United States people, the government and the people of the United States, were not interested in pursuing the actions that would necessarily win the war. You know, I don't think Frank would say that any Marines really got whipped over there. Right. Uh, it's it, you know, it's he, a larger, you know, it, it, a larger it, point. Well, it, the, the, the base was ultimately abandoned. Right. And uh, the frustration of that comes comes through in, in the documentary. How did you feel after, you know, surviving both uh, the Ghost Patrol and, and payback to have you know, to retreat essentially and have that base destroyed. I was outraged. Yeah. You know, I was upset. I was like, <clears throat> what was the point of all these guys dying? You know, it, it, it made it seem like it was lessened, lessened the, uh, the importance of the situation. And it's never really been clear what, what the purpose of holding Quezon was. You, you know, you hear a lot of things. Part of it might have been, as I mentioned in my introduction, it was the largest uh, display of air power, bombings, you know, 2,500 B-52 sorties and uh, 20,000 in total. So it could have been to show the, the firepower that we had. I mean, it's, it's really still unclear what Quezon Well, I'm not necessarily sure that it was to show the Mm -hmm. Firepower was to use the firepower. Use the firepower. Use yeah, the firepower exactly. we had. You know, I mean, we were there. I think to supposedly to interdict a main branch of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which I don't think we ever really did. To be honest with you, I think we were supposed to, but they went, came and went when when they wanted to and where they wanted to. I believe, and then VA. When I say that, so was it worth it? Something you're still thinking about? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I have a hard, hard time saying it was worth it, but then I have a hard time saying it wasn't. Right. That's a hard question to answer. Yeah, you exactly, know. yeah. You know, I mean, all those people that died there that we knew, those those boys, you know, it wasn't worth it for them. Right. You know, uh, so I don't know, that w I couldn't answer that question. Well, I do want to ask you about coming home, because you talk about it in the film, and something... Uh, you know, happened to you, which we've read about in the papers. You know, certainly, I was alive during the time. Um, you were not greeted very well. No. When you came home. No. In fact, what happened? You tell what happened in the uh, well, I, woman when you came home. I flew into uh, El Toro, and they had a about a 15, 20 minute session saying that you know we're back in the world and that we can't. Uh, you know, we can't go around and be crazy and shoot people, and we had to, you know, be a little more civilized. <laughs> and basically, that was it at the time. At that time, it was just like, you know, look, you know, uh, see you later. So when I was leaving, as I was leaving the building to, to go out, uh, they had a chain link fence set up, and there were a bunch of protesters, you know, 40 or 50 uh, protesters out there. And as I walked out and was leaving, they started calling me baby killer and uh, throwing paper and trash at me. And one young girl, when I say young, I'm going to say my age. You know, I was 20, I think, at that time. And she just, you know, had her fingers up through the fence and started screaming at me that, uh, that I was a baby killer and everything. And it, and it really bothered me. So I just, I can vividly remember walking up to the fence and saying a lot of good men died to give you the right to say that. And I walked off. Uh, <clears throat> I learned pretty quickly when I got back to not talk about Vietnam, and not talk about the war, you know, and uh, so I, as most I found out later, as most of us, we just didn't talk about it. I'd like to roll a clip from your film about some other reactions uh, upon coming home. Turn me into a drunk, or I turned myself into a drunk, I don't know. But it just ate away at me. And it was, you know, friends you lost and just the experiences. I don't know, they call it PTSD or whatever. Lack of sleep, you know, just can't sleep. You can't have a relationship. Relationships don't last. You know, there's a lot of strife in the family. Nobody, nobody knows you. Nobody understands you. Nobody wants to hear what's going on with you. You know, it's like your father never talked about the war. I see no reason for you to. I, I know for years and years and years, still even to this day, when I wake up in the morning, 
before I get my eyes opened and I get my first cup of coffee. When my feet hit that ground, when I come out of that bed, I'm in that trench and there's bodies up to my kneecaps every morning. Every morning. And it just doesn't go away. And that's okay. Uh, I've come to, come to accept that. But that's okay. You know, I'm not supposed to forget all that stuff. And I assume that's part of the reason you made this film. Right. Not we're supposed to forget it. We're not supposed to forget it. Major business coming home from war. Um, many, many years where Vietnam veterans were, quote, in the closet, and as you mentioned, didn't talk about it. Be people are now more. What, what do you, we were talking about this last night. What do you think changed it? There's, there's I think 9-11 changed it. It changed it for me. It changed it for a lot of people I know. Uh, I think it, most of us had subdued our emotions, and that attack on those buildings was just like somebody shooting at us. And it brought back for me, for months, I was, I, I had PTSD symptoms that I thought I'd gotten rid of. Uh, but I also think that it gave the American public a second chance to look at the Vietnam veteran with a different eye and see that, uh, you know, we did our job and we did it well, even though it was an extremely unpopular war. Can you know this story? You were in it. What did you learn? that you didn't know making this, it, what, what surprised you? Well, a lot of things surprised me. A lot of things that surprised me, what happened to the men that I, you know, I thought I knew everything that happened to Bravo Company and, and I found out, uh, you know, a lot of p p intimate personal experiences of the men really surprised me. And how they opened up. How they opened up, but, but what happened to them? And, and what, what did you take away from this experience? We'll talk more about the making of this in the web extra, mm -hmm. but as we conclude, what did you learn? Um, in, in the interviews and, and getting to know these people better, um, one of the things that really stands out is how the Vietnam veterans as a whole um, don't want any other veteran to ever experience what they did when they came home and they work very hard to make sure that doesn't happen and I just think that's really generous and, and big of them. Very interesting, and the reaction has been good as you've been touring this around. And as I mentioned, mm -hmm. we'll be airing the film on uh, the 10th, November 10th, the anniversary of, of the founding of the Marines. So thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. We'll, we'll have a nice web extra that people can look up. You've been listening to a discussion about the documentary Bravo, about Bravo Company at the Siege of Khe Sanh and the Vietnam War. For more information on that program, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.